in? There we go. I'm in the right spot, Phil, because I can't see anything. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming today. Uh, we uh, are very excited to have Dr. Economo here uh, from Virginia Tech. Hopefully you had a chance to check out uh, Sophia's bio and understand this interesting talk we're about to have here. We're hosting uh, Sophia through our Quantum Collaborative, which is a new state Arizona state funded initiative. And I wanted to put this out there for anyone interested, staff, faculty, students. Um, we're, we're excited to have anyone interested in this complex landscape of quantum information science technology. Without further ado, you're not here to see me. Uh, if you do want to reach out, my name is Sean Dudley, Chief Research Information Officer. And now I'll hand it over to Sophia. OK. Um, all right, thanks. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to take a break from uh, the weather that's cooling off in the East Coast um, and your nice warm weather here. All right, so uh, today I'll talk about uh, quantum technologies. I'll give a little bit of a general background. I decided last night to remake um, my whole introduction to make it a little bit more accessible. So. I, I'm not, I, I know the audience is a little bit of a mixed audience, probably people from engineering physics, maybe some people with no, um, not much background in quantum. Uh, so that's what I'm assuming. And um, I'm also happy to take questions during the talk. So if you have questions, I, I was told that we can do that from the people in the room and then maybe the Zoom audience can ask later. But please interrupt me, especially if you're in the room. All right. So. Uh, when we talk about quantum technologies, usually we mean these four different pillars. So uh, the most well-known is quantum computing. I'll talk about each, each one of these. Uh, quantum communications and quantum networks is also uh, that is seeing a lot of investment and uh, uh, research efforts. Uh, quantum sensing and quantum simulation. Strictly speaking, quantum simulation can be sort of thought, thought of as part of quantum computing, but it's a really big field on its own right. So we do tend to separate it out. So in the basis, kind of the foundation of all these technologies are fundamental uh, features of nature and especially of quantum mechanics. So these are kind of the ingredients that are common in uh, all these technologies. One is that you need some kind of physical system, just like in regular bits, classical bits in our computer, there's some physical system that represents zeros and ones. Similarly here, uh, the role of that is played by a quantum system. So typically quantum systems are very small and in some cases very cold, uh, but for now we'll just think about it as a system that displays quantum mechanical properties. And these properties are uh, quantum superposition, the fact that unlike a uh, bit in our existing computers, which can only assume state zero and one, a quantum bit can assume a superposition state, so it can be in a linear combination of zero and one. Uh, arguably the most important feature of quantum mechanics that differentiates it for, from classical is entanglement. And this is something you might've heard a lot about, especially following the Nobel Prize um, earlier this month. And this amounts uh, to class non-classical correlations between quantum bits. Now I'll talk about that more in a moment. Another uh, distinguishing feature of quantum mechanics compared to classical, our everyday world, is that when we measure quantum systems, we fundamentally disturb them. And measurement outcomes are probabilistic and measurement is also irreversible. And this is a very important thing to take into account in these technologies. It can be a feature and it can also be an issue. An issue. We need to take it into account when we think about algorithms. Um, and then there is something called the known cloning theorem, uh, which says that you cannot copy unknown quantum states. And that has implications for information security. So if you encode information in quantum systems, there's a fundamental sense in which that information here. All right, so let me expand a little bit more in the idea of entanglement, especially because of all the news stories uh, following the Nobel Prize, some of which were disturbing. Um, so, so I will try to clarify um, and kind of distinguish from 
uh, uh, classical uh, uh, correlations. So you can think of a classical uh, everyday kind of scenario where you have two boxes and you hide an object in each box. And the person who hides them um, hides them according to some rule. And that rule is that if one is red, the other one is green. Right. But you can take these boxes or one of these boxes. You don't know which is which. And then if you open your box and you find the red object in, then you automatically know that the other one's green. This is classical correlation according to this rule uh, uh, we made. Now, the sense in which in quantum systems things are different is that one, the color property is not defined. So in the classical case, the color is already there. You just don't know, right? Some, but but it, it's already existing. For quantum systems, this property is not defined yet. So each individual object does not have a well-defined color. And that color is determined when you observe it. And then once you observe it and you see red, then automatically the other one's green. But you could have observed green in your box and the other one would be red. So this is something that's very different from the classical case. Another difference is that this correlation persists not only if I ask, is this red or green, which was my rule. You could also kind of, this is an analogy, you can also think of some other set of colors. I could also ask, is it orange or blue? And I just pick the color wheel so that I have a sense of a binary choice. The colors that are across in the color wheel, you can think of them as zero and one in the different so-called bases. So this is also important. Uh, has important implications in security and quantum communications. I'm not going to talk about my research in quantum communications, but I just want to give you a feel about other technologies that I won't talk about in more detail. This has implications because some, someone who's trying to eavesdrop know if you and your partner go going to ask, is this or is it blue orange? So there is a sense in which because these properties are not defined beforehand, they cannot be measured beforehand and exploited. And because also uh, the person who's trying to eavesdrop doesn't know which uh, kind of color direction you're going to choose, um, it, th that kind of maybe hopefully gives you a sense of why you can uh, have something secure there. And another important thing is that once you make the measurement and you do check what color you know, your qubits are, so to speak, then these correlations are gone. You kind of use them up. Okay, so quantum computing takes advantage of entanglement in a, in a quite non-trivial and subtle way. Uh, it also takes uh, advantage of constructive uh, and destructive interference. And the types of uh, problems that we know we can speed up are the following. Factoring stands out because it's the only problem for which we know there's an exponential speed up compared to our classical algorithms. And the reason we care about factoring, and in fact, factoring, you can, um, you know, we talk about factoring, but really what the quantum computer does is it's good at is period finding. You can give it a function and it can tell you what the period is. It's quite non-trivial to see how you go from that uh, to, to factoring, but that has implications for uh, security because when we give our credit cards online and we put our passwords online, the security of this depends on the fact that it's difficult to factor or period find. There's other problems that are um, well known. Another one is search. Sometimes we call it Grover's algorithm. Uh, this problem has a polynomial speed up. So it's not as impressive as uh, factoring in that sense. And then finally, simulation, which we believe has an, likely has an exponential speed up, but it's not uh, something that we can prove in the same way we can for a factor. Because there's a lot of hype uh, around quantum computing, and I've reviewed a lot of bad proposals lately, um, I would also like to say what quantum computing is not. <laughs> so the first one, I think, is the most important point. Uh, quantum computers are not general purpose machines that speed up any problem. And I think that's a misconception often, uh, especially if from people coming into the community, that if you have a quantum computer, you can throw anything on and it'll speed it up. So that's not the case. We, you know, there's certainly no reason to believe that's the case, and we don't believe that's going to be the case. Another thing that people sometimes say is that quantum computers solve uh, explore many solutions in parallel. 
that would be really nice. And if it could do that, then we could arguably go back to the first point and solve any problem. The tricky thing is that, as I mentioned, measurement is very singular, very unique in quantum uh, mechanics, quantum formation. So when you measure your qubits at the end to extract some answers, you are fundamentally changing or disturbing that state. So you cannot really extract uh, solutions that are in some sense done in parallel. And then there's also, um, you know, tricky things about polynomial speedups in that you need a big resource overhead. So it's not always obvious how you, you know, how that resource overhead interplays with the speedups you get. There's a lot of, you know, uh, things that uh, are subtle in this field, and I just wanted to, to point them out. All right, the other uh, pillar I mentioned is quantum communications. Sometimes people talk about the quantum internet. And as I tried to kind of allude in the beginning, there is inherent security in encoding systems, uh, in encoding information in quantum systems. And this is kind of nice because quantum computers threaten the security of our information online. But then quantum mechanics kind of offers the answer to that and says, if you encode your information in quantum systems themselves, then you can take advantage of this inherent security. So you can do various things. Quantum key distribution is perhaps the most well known. You probably heard about the satellite that the uh, China has put up, um, which performs quantum key distribution between different points on Earth at a really slow, late, uh, slow rate, but, um, but there's a proof of principle experiment for that. And there's other applications we envision for uh, quantum communication networks, including uh, synchronization and uh, kind of enhancing sensing at a long, uh, large scale. A very interesting application, uh, which is kind of unique so far as we can tell to quantum communication is the one on the upper right. So imagine that at some point, some company will have a quantum computer. A lot of people will presumably want to use that quantum computer, including other companies that have their own IP and their own secrets. The government will want to use it. So you don't want to do what we do now with IBM, where we send our instructions and people at IBM can just see what we're trying to simulate. Right. Eventually, you will want your algorithm itself to be secret. And by transmitting the information in quantum systems, you can actually hide your algorithm in a way that you can send your quantum bits remotely to this company owning the quantum computer. They can run it according to your instructions, but they don't, uh, they, they don't know what you're running. And you can even set it up in a way where they don't even know how large your algorithm is. Um, and then in addition to these applications, which are more communications based, another reason or another way that communications connects to quantum computing is that um, the way we think about architectures of quantum computers is that we're gonna have some modules that we need to connect in some way. Sometimes that's called distributed quantum computing. So a lot of the things that we do, uh, the community does in quantum communications carry over to uh, this model of quantum computing where you break up your architecture into smaller modules and somehow you need to have quantum connections between these modules. And let me just also put the slide about what communica quantum communication is not. Probably this is the most disturbing things you've heard following the Nobel Prize. Um, talking about faster than light communication, that cannot be done. Uh, it's actually, um, um, something that you, you hear a lot. And I actually Googled last night and uh, I'm a faster than light. And the first hit I get is wrong. <laughs> so I, I, I was impressed by that. Usually Google is pretty reliable, but, but not here. All right. And let me get now to the third topic, which is what I'll spend most time on in the talk, uh, which is quantum simulation. And the reason we care about this especially you know, people in science and engineering, is that if we can simulate quantum systems with high accuracy and large enough, we can do things like create new materials, predict the property of molecules, 
chemical reactions, and that has in turn applications in things like medicine, industry, various types of industries. Also from a fundamental kind of physics point of view, we can uh, create new phenomena, new materials, um, hopefully things like room temperature, superconductivity, et cetera. Um, and of course, the reason we want to use quantum computers to do that is that the electrons in molecules and in crystals are quantum mechanical systems themselves. And because they are quantum mechanical systems and you can, they are generally in these entangled states, the size um, of the space that they occupy, uh, the configuration space scales exponentially with the number of electrons. So as a result, it's uh, computationally hard to solve these problems because even storing the information um, takes a lot of space, basically space that we don't have fundamentally, we don't have in classical computers because of this exponential scale. And here you can see, you know, the number of qubits I want to store the state of on the left um, column and the RAM required to store the state. And at the point of around 40 to 50 qubits, you start hitting, you know, a wall of, you know, something that you will never have classical. So the idea is that we want to use other quantum systems which naturally have this exponential scaling in their state to, um, to simulate the quantum interest, uh, quantum systems we're interested in. Okay, so um, since, might be a question. Oh, no. Okay, so um, since um, I think I'm hosted by uh, uh, primarily the engineering uh, uh, college and department, I thought I would show a stack. Um, so, okay, so, you know, this is um, a physicist. This is my sense of a stack, right? In the bottom, you have something that's a physical layer. This is your atoms, your superconducting circuits, whatever your qubit is, your photons. There's another layer on top of that where you need to control them. Then you have to somehow connect them and envision how do you actually make an architecture out of those. There's a lot of things that, you know, physicists, I think know almost nothing about computer architectures. So that's a place where, uh, you know, you need people with that kind of expertise, but of course also quantum expertise. On top of that, you have algorithms and applications. So I'll say a few things about the different, a few of these different um, uh, kind of planes in the stack. I'm not gonna talk about architectures or kind of applications. Uh, but I will talk about algorithms. All right, so what kind of systems do people uh, explore for qubits? This is just to give a little bit of a sense, especially to people who are not in the field, to show you that there's a lot of different uh, physical implementations, and each of these you know, has its own community around. And there's a lot of things you to develop, you know, something that's a good viable qubit, you need to understand the physics at a fundamental level, to know how to control it, to know how to combine it with other such qubits, et cetera. All right, so one type of qubit is uh, uh, spins in semiconductor quantum dots. Uh, a lot of work was done early on gallium arsenide. Now people are tend to be looking more at silicon for uh, you know well, well uh, uh, motivated reasons. Um, then there's trapped ions. Um, so these are atoms missing electrons, so they can be trapped in electromagnetic traps uh, and kind of combine in these long chains. Superconducting qubits, which is what uh, IBM, uh, Google, and Amazon are using. And then there's, other, there's also photons. <clears throat> and there's other systems that are also part of quantum technologies, but not necessarily for quantum computing. So in this table, you know, I. So I, I highlighted which ones are the primary ones people are interested in and for quantum computing. I did not put topological qubits here because there's no qubit yet. Um, and then there's some systems that are really good for quantum communications where the criteria are slightly different. So things like defects in solids, uh, you might have heard of them, they center in diamonds, have optical interface. Of course, optics is what you use to transmit information classically as well. Yeah. Mm 
-hmm. Yeah, that's. Yeah, so let me repeat the question. So the question was that your quantum computer, based on what I just showed you, is most likely or possible going to be some matter qubit. Um, uh, superconducting circuits or um, trapped ions or some kind of matter, whereas communications are done with optics with photons. And how, how does the non-cloning theorem impact that? So you're not cloning the information. What you want to do is state transfer transduction. So you can have two quantum systems. You can have a state here that you may not know. And you might have your blank, so to speak, qubit here, right? So think about this as a state of all zeros. And then your quantum system comes from the network. Uh, the, the photons come from the network, which carry this unknown quantum state. And then you can do something called the swap operation. So you can swap the state. You still don't measure it. If you measure it, you're destroyed. You don't want to do that. And you don't clone it. So uh, in that case, the state is gone from these carriers of information that come in from outside. It's very non-trivial how to do that and very difficult how to do it with a huge amount of losses. So that's something that people are working on quite a bit. Uh, and they are looking at different paradigms on how to do it. So one, one way you can imagine is the thing you send in, the photon you send in, has a, a frequency that matches some, some frequency, transition frequency in your system. That's, it's unlikely that that will be the case, especially because you want the photons most likely you'll want your photons to be in the telecom uh, band, so you minimize losses. So most likely that you will have to have this step, right, right, that is called transduction. And it's something that people worry about, not only for communications, but also for this distributed quantum computing model. So for example, IBM is interested in transduction because you know there's so much you can fit in one dilution refrigerator and you need some connections. So to, to have the, that step, you need, you know, your uh, gigahertz frequency to become optical and then back to gigahertz. And one way to do it is you can somehow, you know, an another thing instead of this kind of release and catch approach that I mentioned where you swap the state, you can also create entanglement between uh, the two systems. Again, you need some kind of communicator of that information. So I you have to transduce the photons, but you can create entangling links between different parts, like, you know, um, two different, let's say, modules of the quantum computer. And then the entanglement is a resource, so you can sort of use it up to do state transfer. And th that's called teleportation. teleportation. Any other question? Okay. okay. Yeah, so this this is more, I'm not going to talk about physical systems too much here, but I just wanted to put it as an introduction just to show that there's a lot, a lot going on. And each of these is its own kind of community. Uh, and you, here I, I mentioned, I listed some of the companies. If I wanted to list them all, you know, I don't have space. <laughs> They're going to eat up my RAM. <laughs> um, okay, so now uh, just thinking further up the stack and talking about quantum states. Um, I think a way to think about qubits if you're used to classical bits is the following. You can have a classical bit that's in state zero and one. We've already done this mental abstraction from the physical layer to zero and one. So if I have something that's either zero or one, I can think of it as a vector in two dimensions, right? Probably doesn't help you much in the classical case, but nothing prevents you from doing, it, right? So if I have my, my quantum, my, sorry, my classical bit in state zero, I could think of that as the vector one zero. And if it's in one, I can think of that as the vector zero one, right? Okay, so then what can I do to a classical bit? This, the only gate other than the identity doing nothing is that I can go back and forth between zero and one, right? Which of course well known as a not gate uh, in, in uh, logic. Since I've, you know, we've agreed, I'm gonna use vectors for my two states of my bit. Then I, what would translate one vector to another is a matrix. So I can think of this transformation, this not gate as a matrix. Again, in the, the classical world, we don't have much motivation to do that, but you can set up your formulas. The reason I want to do this is because that way 
I can motivate more easily why we use linear algebra uh, to, to represent quantum states and vectors, right? So quantum bits can be in superposition of zero and one. So now these two only states that I can assume classically become a vector with these continuous parameters A and B. I do need to normalize this vector. I'm not gonna go into these kind of detail, but the point is that there's this continuous sense of this parameter in the vector. And we can represent this on a sphere that we call block sphere, uh, which is some, sometimes you'll see it. Either as a cartoon or uh, people actually using it for some reason. Now, because this vector can be anywhere, uh, I, I can have operations on it that are more general than this not gate, right? I can rotate it in this space where it lives in. And in this case, this is some rotation parameterized by some angle theta. So quantum gates generally carry parameters. And you might have seen these types of things, which are quantum circuits. And some gates don't have parameters, some do. So in this example here, you see there's a R theta here, which is something that looks a little bit like this. All right, so, so because I'll talk about parameterized quantum circuits, uh, uh, when I talk about quantum simulation, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of what these parameters are. And in my example, I just have a quantum bit. So I have a rotation that we can visualize, right? I can, I can see this in 3D uh, or abstract from that to 3D. But if I have many qubits, I can think of some many qubit analog of that that also has a parameter. Okay, so now, you know, we have our qubit. We know what kind of gates we want to do on it. We also want to somehow physically implement them, right? So the same way that our classical computer has bits and we send in some voltages, there's something analogous thing we do here. And the thing we do here is solve a control problem uh, we, where we have a, a matrix essentially representing the, the energy of the system called the Hamiltonian. And this is a function of time. And the way I change this function of time is by sending electromagnetic fields that change in time. So uh, by sending in these fields, I'm generating different types of evolutions of my qubit or qubits. And then when I'm, these fields are switched off, whatever has happened up to then is my gate. Okay, so this is just to give a sense of the physical implementation of a quantum gate. What's nice is that now with access to IBM that you guys have, you can actually go and do experiments on your own and even play with these uh, uh, fields at a low level, not just through these parameterized gates that the system gives you ready, but you can uh, program your own um, electromagnetic fields to control qubits. All right. So in my group, we work uh, sort of across different uh, directions along the lines I discussed. We do quite a bit with quantum control, quantum computing, sort of closer to the physical layer. Uh, we also have uh, um, uh, research in quantum networks and photonic uh, uh, quantum information processing and quantum algorithms. So I was, you know, I, 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 when you invited me, people seem to be most interested in the third. So I'm gonna focus the remainder of the talk to that. And that lies here. Okay, so here's my outline for the remainder of the talk. I'll say a few more things about quantum simulation. Um, then I'll focus it more to the types of systems we have now and the types of algorithms we can develop at this point. And if I have time, I'll talk to you about two different directions we're pursuing in my group along those lines. Okay, so this is an obligatory Feynman uh, uh, quote who said that uh, nature is quantum mechanical, so you should use quantum mechanics to simulate it. And I would say that at this point, quantum simulation is the most interesting application uh, of quantum computers. It'll be huge if it works. Um, and it, it'll have a lot of, not only industrial applications, but a lot of, I think, scientific applications as well. So I think that uh, when Feynman was talking about quantum simulation, he was probably thinking more about something analog. What that means is that you can imagine you have a system that you can control really well. And let's say it's a bunch of atoms trapped in some potential. The thing you want to simulate is a bunch of electrons in a crystal. You could change 
the system that you can control well to recreate the Hamiltonian, the operator um, represent the energy of the system you're interested in onto your quantum process. That's something you could do and that people actually do. And that's called analog quantum simulation. And the reason you know you want to do that instead of an experiment is that you 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 know we assume you have more control over your simulator. So you can change things that in a real crystal you cannot, right? You can change the spacings between your um, lattice sites. You could change um, how many electrons you have. Uh, you could change change uh, uh, temperature interactions, etc. What's gonna uh, I'll focus more on today is something called digital quantum simulation, where we will use these quantum gates I mentioned and quantum circuits. And in this case, there's no sense in which I'm recreating a Hamiltonian on my simulator. So this is quite different than analog simulation. And it's more general um, uh, by assumption, because if I have, if I'm able to do any, any type of gate by combining, any type of evolution combining these gates, then I can simulate any problem. Whereas the simulator is a more dedicated uh, kind of way to simulate a problem of interest. So the first thing you need to do is to take the problem you're interested in, which could be this strongly correlated molecules shown over here, have a bunch of different atoms, um, uh, uh, um, making it up. And you need to somehow map it on your quantum computer. So on the one side, you have this naturally occurring physical system. On the other side, you have this human-made processor. And somehow you need to uh, figure out how to do this map. So let's go uh, back and think about uh, the chemistry uh, you know, we, we, we learned in uh, uh, undergrad. And first, let's look at an atom, right? If you have an atom, there's these orbits that we kind of think simplify a lot by thinking of these orbits, but let's just think of these orbits. So these are states that the electrons can take. And maybe these are familiar pictures uh, from chemistry, you know, these lob uh, uh, kind of... Um, uh, things representing probability distribution, essentially. So one thing that we need to take into account is that electrons are so-called fermions. And what this means is that each of these uh, kind of wave functions or probability distributions can only be occupied by one electron when I take into account something called the spin. Or you can think of it as two electrons per, per orbit. So now we can actually think about these orbitals, these states that are available to the atom or to the molecule as the fundamental thing. And then the electrons just occupy them. And because I have this sense of it can either be occupied or unoccupied, um, I already have the sense of a binary uh, variable, right? For each of these states, either I have an electron or, or I don't. And since this has this binary sense, and I can also be in a superposition, it, it really is like a qubit, which has two states, zero and one, and can also be in a superposition. So a very natural way to map the problem is to map the occupation of these states onto each qubit on our quantum computer. So then each qubit on our quantum computer corresponds to one of these states of the atom or molecule. Now I'm gonna show a more technical slide. Uh, just for the experts, uh, which is essentially what I just described in a more hand wavy way with equations. So we start with some Hamiltonian, uh, and then we choose a basis. Choosing a basis just means I choose these blobs, these states. Um, and if I do that, then I can do a classical pre-processing step that allows me to write down this Hamiltonian operator. So I know these numbers that enter there. So this operator has numbers and operators. I can write it down. The difficult thing is solving it. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. As I mentioned, the fact that each of these orbitals can be occupied or unoccupied means that somehow the electrons in your physical system know something about the other electrons. So there's some correlations that naturally exist in your molecule, whatever you're simulating. And the way we map this onto our qubits 
because our qubits are distinguishable. We we know, you know, in our if you look at you know IBM system or some other matter qubit system, you know this is qubit one, qubit two, etc. So somehow you have to force your quantum processor to know, you know, to have this feel of um, each qubit knowing something about the other qubit. So these operators translate into very um, kind of delocalized operators, so to speak. So operators that live on many qubits. And that's a price you have to pay for the fact that your simulator is fundamentally very different from the problem you're solving. OK, so we figure out the mapping. And then what do we do? Right. So in a perfect world, our quantum systems behave great. Our quantum computers you know, are in a box. I don't need to know what's anything about quantum mechanics and just run things. Right. Of course, um, that's not what's going on right now. We are still at a point where the quantum systems are really bad. So they're noisy, there's a lot of errors, and they're still not very large. So somehow we have to work with that. And the types of algorithms that I'll talk about today are uh, focusing on these types of systems. And there's, there exists also part of the community that doesn't care about this and thinks, you know, in 2030, whatever years, we're gonna have a perfect quantum computer. So all of our algorithms will be developed for those. At this point, we don't have this well-defined stack where we can really do that. So in some sense, you know, the stack is a little bit of a, uh, of a lie um, because doing something useful really requires understanding enough of it. Okay, so uh, still, you know, uh, it's sad that uh, we have so many errors, but we're still hopeful that if we're clever about things, we can do something useful. And let's narrow down what this useful thing is. So imagine I have a molecule and I want to do something very simple. I just want to calculate, to use my quantum system to calculate the ground state energy of that molecule. That's a, a classic problem in, in quantum chemistry. Um, so, so the quantum processor is not as powerful as we would like it to be, as I mentioned. So we want to leverage our classical computers, which are quite um, uh, powerful, and we want to somehow combine capabilities of both. So in these variational algorithms, which I'll talk about, we're using a principle of quantum mechanics called the variational principle, which is used a lot also in classical simulation, which says that if I take a trial state on my simulator, uh, and trial state means some state that's created through circuits shown over here, where you say I have these parameters that I mentioned earlier in my talk, and I change these parameters, right? You can randomly change them or according to some recipe. The state I create cannot have lower energy than uh, the ground state energy. By changing these parameters, hopefully in a smart way, since I'm bounded uh, below from the true ground state energy, if I have my circuit correctly, then when I cannot go any lower, hopefully I have found the, the energy of the system. Okay, so this is called the variational principle. It's undergraduate uh, textbook, uh, uh, you know, material we learn in in a quantum mechanics class. So then the way this thing would work is I take the system of interest, we figured out this mapping that I mentioned before, um, we prepare quantum states and we make measurements. And we feed the outcome of these measurements on our classical computer, which performs optimization. And then we update these parameters. So the fundamental thing we need here is this parameterized circuit, right? So this tells me these are the gates I'm doing and these are the parameters I'm varying. And then by changing these and making measurements, a lot of measurements actually, uh, hopefully we can get the answer. So there's been experimental demonstrations of this. There was an early paper um, from about five years ago from IBM, which was the first time something that looks, you know, quite like the real thing was shown in the upper um, a row, the three molecules shown over here. So this is simple molecules. You can simulate those on your laptop. Um, so this is more of an engineering achievement rather than a quantum simulation achievement, right? These are things we already know, uh, but it was pretty impressive, especially especially for people who've been in the field for quite a while to see this you know, done on a quantum processor. So this was exciting, at least to me. 
Uh, and then there's other work since then. The Google group has also done quite a bit of work with more than 10 qubits, and this might not even be up to date because it's a very fast moving field. So what we would like is to go from these toy molecules, which we know how to solve, to something we don't know how to solve, that is too large to solve on our laptops or our supercomputers. And how do we do that? Well, of course, we have to work both on the experimental and theory side. On the experimental side, we need better qubits, obviously. On the theoretical side, we can improve our algorithm. So the thing I'll focus on for the remaining maybe five-ish minutes that I have is uh, the work from we're doing in my group for how to do the state preparation. Okay, so everything I'll talk about is about the circuit I showed you. How do you, what do you do to choose a good circuit? So here's what people had done before. Um, so uh, uh, so th these simulations I showed you, uh, th what they use is something called the hardware efficient ANSAT. So this kind of goes back to this idea that our qubits are pretty bad. So we're just gonna do whatever's easiest for them to do. Uh, and what's easiest for them to do is just to do these single qubit gates, which are given by, uh, shown by these boxes that only cross one line. And that's where all my parameters lie. So these are rotations in the space I showed you. And then I have some kind of entanglement, which I do need to build up, uh, denoted by these gates that cross different lines. And I just stack these. And then if I make the circuit long enough, then the hope is that I explore enough of the space where the solution lives, and that for the right choice of parameters, I've actually found the solution. And that's uh, the reason I say hope is that you are really hoping that's the case. Another thing you don't know here is when do you stop, right? I, this is a layered set of gates. It has this repeating pattern. So there's no, uh, nothing here that tells you when do you, are you happy enough that this is your circuit and you parameterize it and you optimize. So another, uh, and, and I should also mention that there's issues um, also with um, optimizing in this. So if you come from kind of a, a machine learning background, things like trainability are, have been shown to be hard. Another thing you can do is take some ansatz, some state preparation circuit that's more natural to the problem you're trying to solve. So you can ask, what are people doing? What are chemists have been doing for you know decades in, for simulating problems on our classical computers? You can look at that to get inspiration. And you can create circuits that are kind of trying to mimic that. It turns out if you do that, your circuits just become too long. So it's very impractical to do that. And we've also shown that at this kind of, when you're trying to make your uh, circuits shorter, you lead to inconsistencies. Still, for small problems, this has been done experimentally, but it's not the way to scale up. So what we have introduced uh, with collaborators at Virginia Tech, is the following. Not just change the parameters in your circuit, but change the structure of the circuit itself. And what we want is we don't want to use too many quantum resources because we, our systems are bad. So we only want to add as many operators as we need. As we keep adding more operators, our systems degrade. So at some point, if we add too many, at the end, we're just gonna get garbage. Our simulation will, will now be reliable. And then we also want to encode into this um, circuit something about the problem we're simulating. So we don't want to use something generic, which is uh, this hardware ansatz. I showed you hardware efficient ansatz. It's very generic. It doesn't matter what molecule you're simulating. It's the same ansatz. What we want to do here is get, you know, inform ourselves somehow about the problem we're trying to solve and create a good preparation circuit. So the, the main insight we had is to make the algorithm adaptive. So don't fix the circuit up front, but create it as you go in tandem with the information you extract from your quantum computer. So in a pictorial way, you can think of it this way. On the left, I have kind of, uh, you know, symbolize my circuit. So I start with some short circuits, some simple gates. Then I can add more and I can add more until I'm done. So this raises two questions, right? How do I decide what to add? And how do I decide that I'm done? So there's these two ingredients that enter this algorithm. So one is, what are my options for these U's, U sub J's, right? 
So my options for these, we call this an operator pool. It's the gates that are available or that I would like uh, possibly to implement on my quantum computer. I can parameterize them and apply them on some reference state. So we call that the operator pool. It takes some skill on how you de decide that operator pool. But then once you've decided it, the next question is, how do I decide which one to add to grow my circuit? So I need some kind of criterion that tells me what do I do next? And the criterion we've used so far, uh, we introduced on you so far, is to ask which of these operators, if I add it, would change the mean value of the energy the most. So you can think of this gradient as telling me which direction in this circuit creation space is the most uh, important. And the nice detail about this is that I can recast this as an expectation value, which is the thing I can measure on my quantum processor. So I can make all these measurements directly on the hardware. So I can use the quantum computer to tell me, my quantum computer tells me what to do next, basically. All right, so we call this ADAPT VQE. Uh, it stands for Adaptive Derivative Assembled Problem Tailored VQE. And this is just the flow chart that tells you you have this operator pool, you use the gradient information, which can be parallelized um, to tell you what operator to add next. You add your operator, you re-optimize all the parameters in your ansatz, and then in your state preparation circuit, and then you keep going. Then you add another operator, again, followed by this um, gradient criterion, according to this gradient criterion, and you keep going. And you're converged, presumably when all these gradients are zero. So when all the gradients are zero, there's no preferred direction to go anymore and you stop. In reality, nothing is zero, so we need to modify this criterion somehow. We can make the, we can ask that the gradients are smaller than some threshold, or we can say the energy should not change more than some quantity. Uh, so, so there's many ways you can choose that. So let me show you some simulations we've done. Everything I'll show you is done on classical computers. Uh, we are working on doing some of this on, on hardware. So these are dissociation curves like chemists um, uh, plot for various molecules. So the first two are lithium hydride, beryllium hydride is what IBM actually did on their hardware. And the one on the right is hydrogen six. These are fictitious molecules, chains of hydrogens, and chemists like to use them to benchmark algorithms. Uh, they're strongly, they have strong correlations and they, because they've been used uh, in different, as benchmarks, they're actually useful to use here as well. Okay, so here we're comparing to this chemical inspired ansatz, which is the orange curve, which you don't see yet because everything falls on top of each other. And then our algorithm is what we call ADAPT for three different thresholds. So as you tighten the threshold, you should get better results. Because everything here falls on top of each other, I'm gonna change the scale on the y-axis and plot the error instead. And I'm gonna plot in a logarithmic scheme. So here, um, because I can solve these problems exactly on my laptop, I know the solution. So that's what I'm comparing. Um, so here you see uh, the orange curve is kind of what was state of the art when we wrote this paper. And you see that we can easily beat that by uh, tightening the threshold and adding more operators to our state preparation. And then, you know, as we keep doing this, of course, the, the problem should be better because I have all the same operators plus some. Now you could ask at what cost do you do that, right? I made a big fuss about not having to use too long state preparation circuits. So this is what we're looking at here, same X axis, which is the interatomic distance. And here, what I'm looking at in the Y axis is how many parameters I have in my ansatz. You can roughly think of that as how many operators you have in your answer. So the orange curve is flat because this is a fixed ansatz. It's a fixed state preparation circuit. It has a fixed depth. And all you're doing is changing the parameters. So this is what we were comparing to. And then you see that in our algorithm, the resources you need are much reduced. So almost everywhere across these different plots, uh, the algorithm I showed you requires fewer parameters in the ansatz to achieve better uh, uh, energy uh, estimation. 
Okay, so I think I'll skip the next slide. And then I just also want to make a point that we uh, have strong evidence that this way of doing things actually leads to better trainability. So here, what we're looking at is adding operators according to our algorithm. And again, looking at the error in the y-axis. And what changes as you, do, as you move across the y direction um, is where I initialize my parameters then. And our algorithm tells you you should initialize them at their previously optimized value. As you add you know, operators to your uh, circuit, keep the parameters as they are up to that point and then optimize on top of that. If you do that, you see that you're sort of insensitive. So, so you know, the energy should be as negative as possible. The, the, the ideal solution is the blue curve. You want to be as close to that as possible. And the green is the, what comes out of our algorithm. So the point is that this creates a really bad landscape, which you're hover immune to. So you see that there exist many local minima. That's what the colors are. But by doing this sort of clever initialization and adding the parameters one at a time, uh, adding the operators on, and uh, uh, one at a time, you, you sort of don't see this mess. So the way we think about this is we're not yet at the overparameterized regime where there's, uh, you know, all minima are good minima. We're in a situation where we're kind of using this grading criterion to dig into the parameter landscape and find or create a good minima. So the last thing I want to show you is a recent work we did where we've generalized this algorithm. Instead of adding just one gate at a time in our circuit, now we add as many as fit. What does this mean? I add a gate here. It, let's say it touches three qubits. I can still add more gates because my, my processor has more qubits. And the way I select the other gates to add, I go and I add the gates that have the next highest gradient that don't touch the qubits I already touched with the first. Um, and actually, especially for the IBM systems and superconducting qubits, idling is bad. So actually, when you don't do gates on these qubits, they behave worse. So there's, there's a motivation on top of, you know, hardware, uh, come from the hardware, to do gates in parallel if you can. And we call this styling efficient trial circuits with rotations implemented simultaneously. Very contrived way to come up with the acronym Tetris, which if you're kind of my generation, you might have spent some time playing um, in the 90s. All right. So uh, we've shown that this strategy uh, leads to much uh, more shallow circuits, like uh, we show pictorially here. And you can get this reduction in circuit depth without paying a price of more C nodes, more, more entangling gates, which is kind of your currency. These are the ones that are the noisiest on the hardware. Okay, so I think I'll show you the slide and stop. We've done a lot of other work with this uh, adaptive algorithms. We worked on optimization problems, showing that you can get improvements. Uh, we've collaborated with nuclear physics people to apply to nuclear physics problems. Uh, we're moving toward more kind of solid state uh, systems and looking at spin Hamiltonians. And then we're also interested in open quantum systems uh, and uh, especially Gibbs state preparation. So trying to create states that are not at zero temperature um, in a, in a uh, kind of similar systematic way. So with that, let me skip this control-based work and just summarize. Um, hopefully, you know, you got a little bit of a sense of how quantum simulation is is pursued, especially at the near term. We are, you know, very interested in trying to, to help answer the question, can we really get quantum advantage in this noisy regime? It's a very important question in the field. We're, you know, doing what we can to, to deal with that. And uh, our solution is these adaptive algorithms that at least in classical simulations have been performing really well. And we also have a sort of control-based approach where you go one layer down in the stack and control your electromagnetic fields directly. All right, so with that, I'm highlighting the people from my group who are working on quantum simulation. There's another set of people who are working on the other topics. Um, and also I want to uh, acknowledge Ed Barnes and Nick Mayhaw, who are the two other faculty we collaborate with on these topics. And of course, our uh, funding agencies and you for your attention.
Yeah. Okay. So the question was, if we consider the open quantum system in our simulations, let's say in the molecules, and if there's a way to, to do that, if we're not doing, so we're not. Everything we do is at um, zero temperature, ground state, closed quantum system. Uh, yes, there are ways to do quantum simulation where you do take the environment to account. You need to use some ancilla. The closest we've done is this Gibbs state, uh, where we don't have an explicit quantum mechanical environment but we represent it with some temperature. And then what we want to do is create a state that's a temperature T where you can vary T and have a state preparation circuit that represents that. Um, you can map prob more, you know, uh, problems that have interactions with quantum. I think not um, enough has been done along this direction. It's a very interesting direction to pursue. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's that's an interesting, interesting thought. You could do everything, you know, with Ancilla and unitary gates, but you could think, can I sort of do like an analog piece to it? And I think that would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't seen anything like that that I can think of right now, but it'd be an interesting direction. So you could treat your system qubits, you know, in a similar way like we do, and then uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. So, so when I said all problems can be solved, I meant all quantum mechanical simulation problems. <laughs> also, you can quantum computer has a classical limit, right? So if I force my qubits to only be zeros and ones and mimic classical bits, in principle, I can perform any simulation I can do on if I have a good enough quantum computer. But of course, at this point, we don't see why you would want to do that, right? You can barely do, <laughs> you, you cannot really do yet the things that quantum computer is supposed to be good at. You wouldn't want to, presumably, I don't know, I mean, things, you know, change a lot over decades, but presumably you wouldn't want to use a quantum computer to do classical simulation. So when I said any problem, I meant any quantum simulation problem. So, so we don't we don't know of algorithms that give you speed ups. You know, finding algorithms to do interesting things is a huge area, open area of research. So, you know, that I'm saying now that these are the only problems. These are the only problems we know of, right? Quite possibly, there exist other problems we haven't discovered yet that can be sped up, right? So finding out what problems you can actually get speed ups for in principle, right? Forget the engineering and the noisy qubits and all that. I have a perfect quantum computer. What problems can be sped up there is an open question. People, of course, are trying to find new types of problems that you can do. But from an engineering point of view, as I said, you could use your quantum computer in a classical mode. Doesn't, I don't see why you would want to do that. Maybe if they're infinitely powerful and it, you don't want to network them, <laughs> classical computer, and you want to do everything within the quantum computer, it sounds like science fiction to me at this point. But, you know, people didn't know what lasers would do, you know, 50 years ago, right? So, uh, but, but, but the short answer is that finding, identifying the types of problems that can be sped up and, the, and coming up with algorithms is really hard. That you said that, yes. Yeah, so that, but right. So, so the question is if the Tetris adapt is we think is better than adapt. So, I think changing the neurons as you go in this analogy with machine learning, we are, I think, adapt already does that. Uh, so I think that I'm not an expert in machine learning, but I think the closest way I can think of it is to have a neural net. And with every iteration, I might add the layer. 
And I might also be able to figure out a new function that connects the layers. So I think that's an analogy to what ADAPT does. Uh, presumably, what Tetris ADAPT does in this analogy is adding you know, more um, kind of in, in, in the Y direction, right, more. And so far, at least for all the chemistry simulation problems, we're convinced that Tetris is better for these two reasons. One, you can condense the circuit a lot. It's a different circuit that comes out. You can condense it a lot. And um, uh, two, for certain types of qubits, like superconducting qubits, you want to do that from a hardware point of view. Not all qubits. So trapped ions actually are not good at doing gates in parallel. So in some cases, you might not want to do it. It's very implementation dependent. And that's why I mentioned, you know, the stack is still not really, you know, we cannot abstract away because we really need to worry about what kind of simulator or compressor are we using to do all this. Um, we have one recent example that uh, only one student from my group has done, and I need that to see to be reproduced to be convinced. Um, recently, um, they found one example where Tetris Adapt did, Adapt does not do as well as Adapt, but that's very very preliminary, and I you know take it with a grain of salt. It's actually results from yesterday. We're rushing to to, <laughs> to submit something. So and this was for the Gibbs uh, state problem. So I don't know if there's something different about Gibbs or not, or if it's just you know some optimization issue, not the optimization not converging, or the student doing something wrong, or <laughs> so it's a, it's a very new um, uh, result that I might not hold. So I'm not so far. I would say with certainty everything we've done thoroughly, Tetris is better. Yes. Chat. Mm -hmm. um, in the ADAPT VQEE algorithm that you outlined, the processes for selecting operators seem greedy. Is it guaranteed that the operator yeah. you select will still be important yeah. when you select more operators? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And you're right. It's greedy in the sense that you're optimizing locally. And no, it's not at all guaranteed. And in fact, I would say it's not guaranteed. Uh, most likely won't be the globally optimal ansatz. But to get that, so far as we can tell now, you need some kind of exponential uh, scaling way of doing it. I, I don't, I mean, to, to, you know, the, the brute force way is just test every possible, you know, combinatorially many options and then decide. But of course, that's, you don't want to do that uh, because it doesn't scale well at all. One yeah. more question in the chat. Um, on the VQE front, what do you think a successful proof of quantum advantage experiment looks like? What characteristics would it need to have? So the question is, how, how do you, um, okay, I don't think I see that, but I think the question was, how do you define quantum advantage? Um, let's see. The question is, okay. what do you think successful proof of quantum advantage looks yeah, like? Yeah, that's, that's also um, something that's not easy to answer. So, you know, to show quantum advantage, you need to solve something you cannot solve classically. But if you cannot solve it classically, how do you verify, right? So I would say there's a few different things you can do, right? For some problems, there's a natural way to grow them. So you might have, you know, these chains of hydrogens, right? You can solve the four, you can solve the six, you can solve presumably the eight and so on. And if you keep increasing the size and everything checks with your classical computer, then you have reasons to trust, hopefully that uh, you know, adding these extra qubits growing the problem will still, that's of course not proof at all. Another thing you would hopefully do is run the same problem on two different, very different quantum processors and ideally even different types of qubits and get the same answer. Another thing you could do is probe some properties of the um, states you're creating and compared to experiment. So there's, I would say, a lot of proxies you can use to convince yourself. But you cannot prove it in a strict sense. I think there's another question. Uh, by optimization, do you use quadratic and constrained binary optimization? Cubo, yes. Um, so yes, that's, that's what we use. You can map these types of problems onto diagonal Hamiltonians, sometimes called easing or ising. And then you can just do essentially quantum simulation the same way I described. Only, the only difference is that your Hamiltonian is now fully diagonal, which is a little bit of a detail, but you can treat it the same.
partnerships with Continuum and others. Uh, so if you're interested, as I said, in exploring these, these topics, uh, we have the capacity for you to do so and a lot of experts also in the mix. So I hope to hear from some of you. Otherwise, I just want to take a moment again to thank Sophia for joining us today. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation.